<laughs> On today's episode, Mike and Ryan and their friends from the Turn by Turn podcast discuss our attempt to create a beer based off of a video game. Cheers. Hi, and welcome to another episode of the Brewers in Law podcast, where beer is thicker than water. Join us on a journey discovering home brewing, craft beer, and more. My name is Ryan. <laughs> My name is Mike. <laughs> How many have you had? Uh, you know what? There's the, the the blank here. Just really looks like I wanted to be Ryan. I think I can see the imprint of this is signature light from beer. A, a this check. is light beer. Yeah. <laughs> My name is Mike. With me here is Ryan. As, thank you. Yes. I am Ryan. And Ryan, would you like to introduce our very special guests? Absolutely. <laughs> so we have with us uh, from our friends at Turn by Turn Podcast, we have Daniel McGar and Chris Harkey. How's it going, guys? Hey, what's going on? It's going pretty good. Yeah. Excited to be here. We are, I've actually We're been looking forward to too. this. I yeah. know. Yeah. We, we, this has been kind of a long time in the making. Now, mm-hmm. what, what, how, when did we first discuss this concept? A couple of years ago, I think. <laughs> it feels like a couple of years like ago. That, yeah. <laughs> Time is not uh, real. I can tell you. Let's see. It was uh, <laughs> it was August 26th that was our first meeting. Oh, oh wow. Yeah. Really? So this is <laughs> been... almost a full year. Almost a full year. Wow. That's insane. That is. Yeah. That's complete insanity. Well, so uh, guys, but before we dive into the, the first sip, well, why don't you just uh, re- re- real quickly... Um, well, why don't you just sort of explain what Turn by Turn podcast is to anybody who's not familiar? As you should be, because it's awesome. <laughs> you want me uh, to take that one, or you want to do it? Uh, it's up to you. Uh, it seemed like you had something ready, so go for it. <laughs> <laughs> he has no notes. He <laughs> told us they have never notes. Yeah. You guys yeah. never do notes. Do notes oh, anymore. I do notes. <laughs> <laughs> That's how he keeps you on track. I do yeah. pages and pages of notes. <laughs> I told them you keep us on track and I, I tangents, so, but um, the Turn by Turn podcast is a RPG based podcast where we talk about RPG video games and topics related to them. And if you're more a beer person than a video game person, that's role playing games like adventure things, <laughs> medieval things, sci fi things, things of that nature. Yeah. Heard stuff. Awesome. Yes. Fun fun games. Like, I'm, I'm I mean, a both guy. <laughs> I, I am both as well. So I, I don't play as many as, as you guys do, but like I do. I actually I've learned more and more after listening to your podcast that games I play are actually role playing games. So like my one of my favorite games is Mass Effect. And it never came to my mind that Mass Effect is a role playing game because you're playing the role of Shepard. Yeah. You are that person. So there's a skill it's a well tree. Game. Yeah. There's a skill tree. Yes. I mean, you're... I mean, that's that's the ideal is that you know you don't think about it too much. It should it should feel very natural if it's a good game. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, all right. So uh so basically just to to uh I will explain the concept of the episode a little bit to lead us into the first sip. So mm-hmm. we we discussed uh with Daniel and Chris kind of what we wanted to do. We were interested in collaborating. What would be the most sensible thing to do? And what we kind of settled on was that they were going to, uh, for lack of a better term, assign us a sign, yes, uh, a, a game that they felt had a very strong aesthetic personality. Ryan and I were going to try that game for a while, um, and then we were each going to attempt to create a beer that captured the essence, the kind of spirit or the central aesthetic of mm-hmm. that game, um, and so. The, the the game that uh, uh, that they decided on is is a, a game called The World Ends with You. We'll get into that a little bit later. But for the first sip, I kind of wanted to I wanted to get into a little more this idea of just sort of adapting a video game mm-hmm. uh, because it's something you see a lot right now with you know movies and TV shows. It's it's sort of uh, so hot. Yeah, so hot right now to adapt uh, gaming franchises into other forms of media. Uh, however, there's sort of this stigma that it is often not done well, and that a yeah. lot of times the adaptation sort of loses sight of what was great about the original property. So I'm not restricting us to media. This can be literally anything from, you know, merch, any any kind of merchandise. It can oh. be media, um, but I, I would like everybody to share something that is based on a video game um be it uh again a tv show or a lunchbox that that you think <laughs> does a good job of capturing the essence of whatever game it's based off of so uh 
I think the guests are going, going in alphabetical order. Chris, why don't you start? <laughs> there it is. <laughs> sure, sure thing. C comes one letter before D. Uh, um, I would say you you say stigma. I would say pattern. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. Yes, unfortunately, stigma maybe uh, uh, it, it implies that it isn't necessarily true and it is it is very true probably true yeah Yeah, and and i think it comes from like the the most recent example uh not to date when we're doing this but it's uh the halo tv show i would say and yeah Yeah. the I, i think the writing is already on the wall when you have the creative director saying did we look at the game no of course not (laughs) <laughs> that's like the the guy that that became um dumbledore um like he 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 like famously said i never read the books because i never actually wanted to like give any like give myself anything uh to be that role he wanted to make it his own and my wife always points us out the goblet of fire he in the book it says he calmly walks up and harry did you put who put your name in the goblet but in the movie, it's him yelling very much so, who put your name in the goblet? And it's yeah. like, she always points it out every single time. Yeah. Uh, that's sad. Yeah. I kind of want to watch a Halo movie or a Halo <laughs> show too. There's ways to, that I, there, there's times I think that's a good idea. Like maybe if you're going to be an actor, but definitely if you're the person overseeing all of this, oh, you yeah. should probably <laughs> know what the Goblet of Fire is. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and like if, you don't have to be beholden to your source material, but you you should at least understand it. Mm-hmm. So, uh, like, yeah, if, I, uh, if you're not my, even my favorites are when it that that doesn't bode well. Yeah, yeah, I, my favorites are when you are really familiar with it, and then either you decide we're gonna we're gonna adapt it and we're gonna do it justice, or we're not even gonna try and we're gonna get weird with it and have fun. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm up for either of those. Okay, well, um, well, so with that in mind, what is your example of uh, of it this done well? Uh, I've got two. Uh, my first one is uh, I'm huge into the game series Fire Emblem, and they did a card game that was only in Japan, but I, being the nerd I am, uh, imported a bunch of the cards and have little sleeves that have translations on them. <laughs> um, so I can still play that game, even in English. Nice. And uh, nice. Fire Emblem is all about the characters, and so is the card game. It, it gives you a, a really good chance to cycle through using a lot of characters. And uh, I, I found that I really liked it because when you're opening, like, let's say, uh, Yu-Gi-Oh! or Pokemon cards or Magic cards, if you, any kind of card game, um, there's times that you win, kind of, and times that you lose. Because mm-hmm. you don't really have a connection with uh, Goblin number 43. Yeah. But with Fire Emblem, all of the cards are these characters that you care about. So even if you don't get the rarest cards, you still are like, oh, hey, there's there's uh, John over there, Ike. Like, oh, I'm super <laughs> into Ike's character. So it doesn't really matter that he's not rare. It's cool that I have that one. Yeah. Um, so I thought that was really good. And then uh, uh, the uh, more accessible one that you guys could all check out is I'm huge into uh, the Warriors series as well. Dynasty Warriors, Samurai yeah. Warriors. Etc. And uh, they did a Dynasty Warriors movie, and it is campy, it is ridiculous, and it perfectly <laughs> emulates the game. I was gonna say, if, 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 if you gave me like 10 choices of adjectives for those games, I might well have picked those two. Yeah, those exact ones, yes. Yeah, <laughs> the, the movie is everything that the games are, and there's times that you look at it and you go, how that didn't translate very well, but they were faithful and it yes. is fun. <laughs> That's awesome. So I, I think I gave it, uh, I, I review movies sometimes. I think I gave it a four out of five and said like, it's terrible and I love it and I will watch it <laughs> yeah. many more times. Right. It's a bad movie that I had an absolute blast watching yes. and would watch again. Yes. <laughs> oh yeah. And you I can tell the people that made it really enjoyed the source material. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, All right. Next uh, alphabet. All right, Daniel, let's hear it. Uh, So perhaps less interesting. um, I feel like the Lord of the Rings movies capture the spirit of the books pretty well. Um, The books are perhaps a little more dusty and historical, but I feel like the movies capture the essence of the books pretty well. Yeah, Uh, I agree. So that, less funny perhaps, but. (laughs) (laughs) All right, uh, that that puts it to me, right? Yeah, so I... uh... 
I actually really struggled with this. I was so like stoked about my idea and I couldn't <laughs> freaking think of anything. So I'll say a couple of quick shout outs that I can't speak to. I've heard that the Castlevania and Cuphead TV shows are both pretty, pretty good. Um, Castlevania one is great. Watch yeah, the whole thing. I've heard. Yeah, I've, I've, I've heard that it just like even just as television is just mm-hmm. absolutely fantastic, but I've never watched it. So I, I actually it. watched it with someone who had never played the games. And oh, really? uh, that was my girlfriend and she absolutely loved it. OK, okay. cool. Um, but yeah, so the I have two. One of them is this one is is a little weird because it's a this is actually something that comes up like this is like just a Ryan and I off the podcast conversation <laughs> bingo card. And it's the the trailer to the first Gears of War that was set oh, yeah. to Mad World by Gary, the Gary Jules cover. It's just like if you want it's weird because a trailer, an adaptation, you know, like I was mostly thinking like stuff based on the game that you're meant to experience after the game. But a trailer, obviously, you meant to experience before. But nonetheless, if you needed an encapsulation, like, of what to expect from Gears of War, like, that trailer was perfect. It was, yeah. I went, I need to buy that game. (laughs) And then I did. And then it was exactly what I hoped it would be. Um, And then my other, so I suppose this is my my canon answer. Uh, It is uh, a red Angry Birds plushie. (laughs) that i owned in college for a while <laughs> because it's a, it was cute stuffed circular adorable and all we did with it was chuck it at things and knock them down <laughs> like i mean that's what you're it to was do. it's a simple game it was the perfect encapsulation of that game as like if you could turn that game into any marketable item a that's light little thing. plushie that you can like is chuckable yes was the perfect thing to turn it into <laughs> So I really do think that that is uh, that's my answer. Yeah, not what I thought what you were going to say. <laughs> no, I knew I knew it wasn't. <laughs> um, I have two as well. I I, I was going to say one, um, but I feel like everyone's going to boo me. Um, and that is the nineteen nineties yeah. Super Mario <laughs> Brothers. The movie. <laughs> the movie. Whoa. No, it is horrible. I did, no. I'm just I'm joking. That is yeah. definitely not even close. As a kid, I loved it. And then as I became knowledgeable any way of movies, I realized <laughs> it's the worst thing in the world. I really wanted to hear a long monologue of you defending that. <laughs> I know. If I was probably about 20 maybe, years younger, I would. Maybe because 20 years younger, yeah, Ryan would. Maybe that needs to be some sort of, uh, you know, if we ever like launch a Patreon, that, <laughs> that, that, that'll be like a for our patrons yes, thing. Or maybe it'll be like it. a subscriber bonus <laughs> objective. Ryan <laughs> defends for an hour why the Super Mario Brothers movie is a stone cold 10 out of 10. Um, the, two, the two I was going to say, I was going to say um, Arcane, um, which is um, I League of, the League of Legends. Yes. Yeah. Uh, the show. I haven't played the matter, game. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't not really played matter. the game, but the, sh- the show is phenomenal. I love the artwork. I love the music. And I have talked. I have heard from other people saying that it is perfect matching to the video game art wise and everything else um the other one i was going to say and i might get a little slack for this one too is detective pikachu because i thought it was amazing and i thought a little more futuristic of the world of pokemon but like it still had the same feel and vibe of being in the world of pokemon just having all the neon lights and everything that's like your opinion man yeah i know it's like (laughs) just like super mario brothers is the greatest movie ever people Uh, bonus episode number two yes <laughs> <laughs> all right uh so ryan before we begin uh we uh well, one of our kind of uh impetuses i'm not sure how to pluralize that but for doing this episode uh, was the relatively warm reception that season one's finale uh mm-hmm. where we we did a similar thing for the zelda franchise got and i believe you had some feedback you wanted to read yes based off of that episode so i was just gonna go through a couple of these um so all related pretty much to uh david celeste and shane sharing um their when we, they got everything from us so maximilian olstead olmstead uh said uh this is awesome can i buy this beer which unfortunately no you can't um we had Let's see where to go. I lost it. There it goes. It says that uh, this is Quasmar. Uh, they said that is fantastic. I'm sure their batches are small, but would they consider shipping on Deathly Pay for a bottle too? Again, I mean, I could ship it, but you can't 
technically buy it, I guess. <laughs> we'd have to we'd have to do some sort of bartering. <laughs> and then there is this guy named Daniel McGar mentions, uh, and he said Link is normally getting drunk on low low milk, so this should be great. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, what what didn't we actually I know we had at least talked about it, but didn't we actually make it a plot point within the uh like later in the the episode whether um whether lone lone milk canonically like oh, it alcohol is. content? It's, it's, it does. <laughs> yeah. Um but yeah, so well with that in mind, uh let's let's dive into the main portion of the episode. So just to give our listeners kind of a general overview of how this is gonna go. Well, we're, we're going to sort of just go over our impressions of the game. Um, I think we'll have Daniel and Chris maybe uh, talk a little more about that, yeah. talk a little more about it. But uh, in the first half of the episode, we're going to kind of discuss how we came up with the uh, idea for our recipes. And then over the break, we are all going to complete the tasting survey fresh mm-hmm. so that after the break, we can all talk about the results. So it's not like we did last time where we recorded everybody like, sent in their survey responses ahead of time here we're going to do it so it's nice and fresh Mm -hmm. um and then the second half of the episode will be us sort of discussing the responses to those surveys yep um so yeah take it away ryan all right so um the game we did as we said um the uh, the world ends with you it is it's uh, it's a great game uh i thankfully was able to get it on sale on the switch it is available on the switch if you would like to get it um it's fairly quick like I, I i didn't realize how far i was going into the game um and just like i just kept wanting to do more and more and more of it and finding out more and more little details about everything about the game i unfortunately haven't beaten it yet i'm stuck on a part i cannot get past and i i rage oh, really? quit a little bit yeah i rage <laughs> quit i i tried so many times to get past this um this part of noise uh, which is the the demons i guess you would call them that you have to fight and everything yeah may, maybe maybe we should start with a quick intro to yes intro to the game so uh daniel and chris we we were kind of we were thinking we would try and keep this spoiler light you know so maybe like uh, uh obviously the the setup of the game is you could consider like early game spoilers but we, yeah. you need to explain the yes. concept so, yeah, <laughs> do you guys maybe just want to like for anyone who hasn't played the game or isn't a gamer just maybe a little elevator pitch about what this game is sure uh I, i'm a little more familiar with it so i can do that yeah um i wanted to look up again okay i wanted to remember what year it came out so uh the world ends with you came out in 2007 and i think that's important oh, yeah. because it uh predated <laughs> a lot of uh the other things that I would say are kind of in the same genre of um, sort of very serious games. So the way that uh, this game works, the the story is you play as the main character who is named Neku, and he wakes up in the street in Shibuya District in Japan, which is a real place. Uh, it's not like in a fictional setting or anything. Yeah, You're running around a very real existing city. And... Uh, Neku comes to the realization uh, very, very quickly, this is not a spoiler, really, um, that he is dead. And that is very unfortunate. He's not happy about that. But uh, there are some people running around that call themselves Reapers, and they are benevolent enough to give you a second chance. So you need to find a friend to team up with to play uh, a certain amount of games. And if you come out victorious, then you can return to life. Yep. That's that's a very positive spin. That's a very- <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, I I think that's a great uh, that that's a great uh, kind of general intro to the game. Mm-hmm. I, I remember when you guys pitched it to us as like something with a strong aesthetic. You literally just said like type it into Google Image Search. You'll you'll get it immediately. Yeah. No, so absolutely. I would say like if you've never played the game, just do that thing because you really do get a sense of the game's like art style on any screenshot absolutely any any like uh promotional art like it it just it comes through thick yeah um so yeah my my recommendation actually would be there's an anime show now i think it's 12 episodes and i've not watched that yet but if you just go watch the opening sequence for that on youtube uh i think that that'll that'll probably give you the best indicator because one of the most important parts of that aesthetic which i didn't spoil for you guys uh before you made your beers but 
Um, one of the most important parts of that aesthetic to me is the soundtrack. Yeah. Yes. No, yeah. that soundtrack was awesome. Yeah, like, you just like you just really sit there cool. jamming to it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I I guess, yeah, before we get into too many specifics, Daniel, did you have anything you wanted to add about the uh the kind of just general like elevator pitch of the game? Uh that sounded pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> without super spoilers um it definitely has that like you're stuck in a game that's sort of really unspecified so um fans of lost would probably kind of dig this game i can see that yeah, yeah. um yeah and and I, I would say too like for for something that's like was sort of big in the cultural zeitgeist it it definitely the sort of the game the use of game here sort of puts off like hunger games vibes a little bit yeah, a little bit you know it's it's <laughs> It, it's not, or maybe Squid Game would be more of a timely reference to, <laughs> yeah, to yeah, definitely date that one. this, uh, the release of this podcast. But uh, yeah, like there's definitely a sense of menace to the word mm -hmm. game there. Yeah, um, and it, it was a fun, like I, I treated it as one, even though I probably shouldn't have, but I, it was a great button masher type game where. Yeah, like you, you could you, if you needed you, to, yeah. yeah. So like it was just fun to just try to do everything as fast as you can, make sure you're not overdoing it, waiting for the recharge and then going back at it. It's just, it was, it's, it's a, it was a fun game. Yeah, and I guess that bears mentioning, like, from a for anybody who is interested in actually checking the game out, or just from a gameplay perspective, it originally came out for the Nintendo DS, which had the little stylus touchpad. So you, you attacked <laughs> through these like gestures, um, you know, like you could click on a certain thing, or you could swipe your finger, like whatever, and then like based on what, based on the situation, uh, you could sort of execute different commands mm -hmm. that way. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you had to cool. do that. And then the, your partner uh, that you fought with was on the top screen and you had to control both of them at the same time. And oh, cool. uh, that's actually because the, the switch version doesn't exactly work that way, which is the mm -hmm. version that we played. Yeah. I, I played the DS. So that's what I'm more familiar with. And uh, I wanted to say to you, but depending on what kind of uh, weapon you're using, the input you have to do does change. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of tapping, but um, Daniel liked a lot in the episode we did uh, on it over at Turn by Turn. Um, the my best uh, layout or loadout had um, one that incorporated the DS's microphone. Oh, okay. <laughs> So the, the most effective way to do that is just to blow into it over and over. Yeah, but Daniel, yeah. of course, was like, were you just sitting there going, ah, <laughs> <laughs> ah do it faster, yeah. do it again. Just like, yeah, it, imagine if you like, uh, you're living in an apartment building or something, and it's like at two in the morning playing the game going, ah, and your neighbor's oh, like, hell. I was thinking about since it's on a portable system, the DS, you know, you're sitting on the bus, just <laughs> ah. on the subway, yeah. <laughs> of course, when you sit on the subway going like just blowing into That's it as right. well, it looks just a little bit weird. That might make people really uncomfortable. Yeah. Actually, make a better yelling. Uh, That's probably true. Uh, all right. So Ryan, you'd already you'd already gotten a little bit into your impression of the game. Yeah. Uh so I guess do you do you want to maybe do you want to keep rolling with that? I, I sort of cut you off so we could do the elevator pitch, but I know you were you were talking about your experience playing the game. And uh, I mean, the fact that I just rage quit, I mean, well, it's, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but no, like it, it, it's, it was a great button mashing type game for me. Um, I'm trying to get my wife to play cause she likes playing button mashing games, but <laughs> she is so far into Stardew Valley right now. Thanks Mike for that. You're welcome. Um, that oh, she... by the way, uh, speaking of great adaptations, the occupation of farming, a great real life <laughs> adaptation of Stardew Valley. <laughs> oh, stop it. Yes. Okay. Um, but yeah, no, I, the one thing I definitely got from this game, like as we kind of already talked about, is the vibe in general. Like the artwork itself is amazing. The the feel and vibe of being in Japan. I thought, I mean, I correct me if I'm wrong, where you're playing is like a suburb of Tokyo, correct? I believe yeah. so. Okay. Specific district. Yeah. Maybe not a suburb. I think it's like a, an area of the, the city proper. Okay. So like it 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 felt very much like the vibe especially back in 2007 how you would feel tokyo was like i'm picturing like like it almost like had slight dragon ball z feel to the animation um, yeah it definitely with with the hair. It, yeah. it was like a, it yeah it was like a particular flavor of yeah. kind of anime that mm -hmm. that sort of went that way so and then like even the vibes of how the characters dress like i actually had a friend um i can't think of your the you're not who you play but your friend 
in the game, the way he dressed and acted was like almost on point for how I had a friend at that point in time as well. We yeah. want to beat in rhyme, like yeah. not, not your main partner. No, but yeah, the other two, yeah, the best friend. Yeah. At the beginning. Yeah. yeah. So having the, the, the hat on the side of the pants, yeah. um, have like that, that oh, whole she, outfit. Yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah. Having that whole outfit was just him. I was, I looked at him like, you are now Jeff. You are my friend Jeff. <laughs> I only know you as Jeff now. Is, you were Jeff. Yeah. That's um, funny. but no, it was it it was a great game. Like I said, the soundtrack was just like I could put that on and and listen to that soundtrack and work all day and not get sick of it at all. So how really how good. would you if you were to describe the soundtrack in a sentence? <sighs> lo-fi almost like kind of lo-fi meet EDM, like kind of like the the slow and the fast kind of ha- like mixed in the middle interesting yeah yeah but like lo-fi before lo-fi because yes, in, yeah, in 2007 like, like lo-fi <laughs> yeah that, i would have never thought of it that way but you're right it is like it's kind uh, of like what you expect to see in like in a, a a final battle in a in a movie or tv show yeah in an animated show actually so like not maybe mm-hmm. not quite dragon ball z but something along that line where mm-hmm. you're facing the final boss and you're about to go all out <laughs> yeah what about you how'd you feel about the whole game itself? uh well, so uh, uh, stick in, I, you know, maybe we'll just stick in the soundtrack for a second. One of the things I thought was interesting was that it was like sort of at the core, it was this sort of beats driven mm-hmm. kind of deal, but uh, it had these weird forays into other genres. Like they just pop in some like new metal guitar all of a sudden, yes. or, or <laughs> like, uh, or there'd be like, uh, um, you know, like kind of different versions of like pop um like singing you know Mm -hmm. either like like uh like high register female pop singer or or, um that's like the the one that i'm remembering but like there was like a big range of different like spins they would put on it that Mm -hmm. all kind of felt it felt scattershot but also somehow like really um like all still tied together Mm -hmm. and very of like the two the the aughts yeah um, I definitely got like tons of 2000s vibes from this. <laughs> do, do you guys have anything to add about the soundtrack? Yeah, it feels very like dissonant, which matches the game really well. Yeah. Where, it, where it's like you get those kind of like odd placed instruments, but like the whole tone of it like feeds back to that. So like, whereas in like a normal game, it'd probably be like, what the heck is happening? Like it just works because mm-hmm. yeah. of that like more frantic style. Yeah. yeah it's like energetic but dark yeah yeah i would add that uh i the the thing i would call it would be like um if a bunch of 2000s era hip-hop and jazz people got together and made <laughs> a soundtrack going tr- going very try hard with it um in a nightclub that is also a garage <laughs> I, I and, uh, actually understand everything you're saying. Yeah, right now. <laughs> I, I say, that's one of those things that's like so oddly specific. You can't help but know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I always like to throw out too on the topic of soundtrack. Uh, it comes through like you guys played it on Switch, but it came through at that same level of quality on the DS, which was insane at the time. Nice. And uh, the way yeah. they were able to do that uh, is that the audio and cutscenes, or just audio for. Uh, soundtrack and cutscenes was one fourth of the total storage on the ds cart wow Wow. dang (laughs) that's that's beefy yeah um yeah so and kind of working off of that um idea of it being like very centered in the 2000s i thought that the um the sense of fashion was very centered in that as well. And particularly like the kind of Japanese video gamey sense of fashion is sort of like how I thought about it, just because that, that would be sort of like the other influences I would match it up to that I was exposed to in 2000. Like, I don't know if, if you guys um, ever, there's this PlayStation two game called the bouncer. Did any of y'all ever play that? But if if you like ever look up screenshots of that game, it was like basically not this art style, but like the exact same like fashion trends, but like just adults and a little <laughs> edgier and try hardier and like body piercing ear. But um, <laughs> but yeah, like uh, that that was like the first thing that popped into my head, and then also just um, like uh, Jean Co jeans. 
Yeah. You know, that was yep. the other like very Jinko yep. jeans, like uh, the those sorts of uh, yeah, like it, it it's it was almost just like an exaggerated version of like I was in middle school in not in 2007, but in like the early 2000s. Mm-hmm. And I just feel like so much of like the sense of fashion in my middle school, particularly, and then like early high school matched up really well with what this game kind of offered like exaggerated or like slightly different, you know, mm-hmm. seen through the lens of another country, like versions of that. Yeah. Um, and also like sort of going along with that, the two thousands were a time when like, um, uh, if I'm remembering right, that was like Tony Hawk's pro skater era. And oh, yeah. like, uh, oh, yeah. skating was like pretty huge too. And you definitely yeah. see that influence in there too. And like the, uh, like graffiti and like all of those sorts of need things. Need for speed as well. That's need for speed. Yes. Yeah. 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 So all of that sort of stuff, I, I feel like I'm not saying that like those were their influences per se, but like those are, those would be like my 2000s influences yeah. that I saw kind of represented to some extent yeah. in the, the sense of fashion in this game. Mm-hmm. What do you guys think about that? No, I'm, I agree 100%. Um, like the only other thing I'd probably add to that is maybe more less extreme, but like Tokyo Drift, uh, Fast and Furious, like that, that same vibe yeah. as well. It's not like over the top with like girls in like these tiny outfits and everything else. So it's just like kind of exaggeration of the outfits, like all the furs and the weird yeah, like graffiti yeah. on the on the shirts and everything, the crazy jeans and everything else like that. That's the vibe you I saw in that movie. And it, still falls in suit with this game how about you guys um something i think that doesn't come across as well uh that doesn't completely survive the cultural jump is uh how rebellious all these people kind of are (laughs) um because we you know in america we're we're much more tolerant of um everything in the business world (laughs) yeah um I mean, it really is true. Uh, I was just the other the other day watching a documentary on um, metal and punk musicians in Japan, and they were asking them, you know, what would it take for you to get like an office job, even or or just some sort of public facing job in uh, the market today? And the, and this is in 2022. And uh, the girl they were asking was like, well, you know, I couldn't have blonde hair i would have to like re-dye it black and i would have to cut it super short and then i couldn't even have like earrings because women's earrings are still that's that's too punk oriented so (laughs) you compare that to you know how the characters look in the world ends with you and you're like oh my goodness like (laughs) these are are some hooligans yeah 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 sort of set against the yeah the kind of like cultural backdrop it Mm-hmm. You're, you're right because like for uh, that did not necessarily strike me as like wow these are like like they're really like rebels uh it was jeff, more just like, like yeah jeff. they're teenagers <laughs> <laughs> yeah. in america that's an average teenager <laughs> mm-hmm. you're not gonna tell me how to live my life but yeah that's that's really interesting i wonder i never really paid attention to it but like do all of the like random like faceless other people in the world are they all like pretty standardly attired? I think, I think so for the most part. Yeah. Business suits and whatnot. Business suits. There, there's suits. some that aren't because you're still in Shibuya, which is kind of the fashion district. It's kind of the yeah. kind of the arts district. So you're gonna find some people that are a little more artsy. Maybe a little more out there, yeah. You, you Chris, you you seem to know like a fair bit about the Shibuya district. And then I know like that for me was another thing we haven't gotten to. Maybe it's like the last major item that I had on my list um, yeah. as like being like a huge part of this game. Did you want to just speak a little bit as to like what that district is like? I'm um, sure. Uh, I think that one of the the biggest things that's defined by is landmarks. And I think that's really cool that that comes across in a, uh, in the game, um, Daniel and I talked about on our show some the uh, the meeting point throughout the game that your characters reuse over and over is the Hachiko statue, which is the statue of a, a dog that kind of yeah. sits in the middle of the whole thing. And uh, Daniel didn't know that story, but um, and I didn't either playing the game. But I, I remember being like, this is a real area. Why is there just this big dog statue? Everybody knows what it is. And so the story on that was apparently... Um, this uh, dog's owner died 
And I think it would, they said it would take like the dart train or the subway every day, the dog would by itself to go visit <laughs> where the owner used to be and it would go wait for him. And then uh, eventually the dog died because it got old and yeah. that's just what happens. And uh, the people were so touched though, that the dog had come every day to wait for his owner where him and his owner used to go that they built a statue. So he would always be there. Wow. Oh, that's really cool. I didn't know that at all. Yeah, I didn't know that either. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, I thought that was a really cool thing and there's all sorts of cool little landmarks. There's the big tower in the middle. Um, and then just all the, the stores that you can go to. And I think, you know, I I'm down in Texas, so I can point to like our areas that are even kind of similar, but even our, our arts districts are not as artsy as, is this, uh, yeah. no, but that could also just me be me viewing it through my cultural lens and being like, I've known this for all my life. This isn't as weird. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, uh, you definitely, that, that does come across like a lot of the missions too, seems to be to like, I'm specifically recalling one to that like concert venue, um, mm. where like the lights are all off at the beginning. Yeah. They stay, they, they would almost like base missions around like visiting these landmarks. Um, one of the, one of the things that struck me too, was just how like vibrant and colorful it was, mm -hmm. um, like not the way people dressed, but like also, yeah, they were just like, it, it, it reminded me a little bit the way it was like packed full of all these like characterful little shops and restaurants and stuff, almost of something like in Michigan, like downtown Ann Arbor, maybe a little bit, you know, kind of, yeah. uh, a, a little free spirity lots of good food, lots of restaurants, and they're all kind of like packed together and like one interesting thing and then another. Yeah. And Ann Arbor isn't really like, it's not a one-to-one, -one, but no, I, I think it's pretty not. close. And it's like kind of the best thing that comes to mind for me. Um, but yeah. All right. Well, speaking of bars and restaurants and everything else, let's, let's get back to beer. I love the game, but we are beer. Yeah. Let's we are well, beer. So, <laughs> if, if you don't mind then I, I think talking about shibuya is a good uh segue for me to sort of talk about mine maybe uh, i think we're running a little long on time here so maybe we'll we'll each like briefly pitch our yeah you give like, our, our theme idea and then we'll go to break still pitch it and maybe get like a quick ingredients and everything else and you want to do recipes yeah we do okay. recipes well so all right so basically what i wanted to capture with my version of the beer so we i i, I think i got out most of my comments about what i sort of took from the game aesthetically mm -hmm. the thing that really struck me that we maybe really didn't talk about was the interesting way that this game like the reaper's game superimposed on top of it was like this dark game for survival like they talk about it as like the right to exist and if you lose you cease to exist and it's like mm -hmm. all this really uh it's just really like kind of existential rhetoric mm -hmm. but it's laid over this extremely vibrant full of life district yeah. um super colorful and full of like a lot of zest and personality so i i decided to try and recreate that as a uh i wanted to sort of represent that weird dichotomy in the form of a layered beer so mm -hmm. we we recently did our episode on black and tans um you know where basically you have uh, a pale beer uh typically bass layered underneath a half a glass of guinness so you mm -hmm. have this dark on top of light thing going on and it looks really cool and i thought that was a good representation of the sort of setup in this game um so i ended up making uh I don't have the recipes handy on me, but I basically made two beers um, that were meant to be poured as a layered drink in this sense. So yep. on the bottom you had, um, I made a, a cherry hibiscus wheat ale. Yep. Uh, that so sounds good. That sounds really good. Yes. We're going to get to try it soon, but, um, <laughs> but yeah, so the, the idea being for, so first of all, hibiscus, <clears throat> um, you know, cherry adds a little bit of like a, well, fruitiness. Mm -hmm. um, I, I used uh, black cherry to add a little bit of sweetness and then balance that out with hibiscus, which um, if you've never had like anything like a hibiscus tea, you can get like dried hibiscus flowers. Mm -hmm. um, if you make a tea with that, you'll notice two things. One, it is like surprisingly tart for something made from flowers. It's like really, really tart. Mm -hmm. um, and so I wanted to add that quality to the beer because um, I think that those flavors kind of fruity and tart that sort of pop represented what I felt Shibuya was like. 
And then also hibiscus adds this like bright red yes. tint, super, super like vibrant red color. And I thought that that was also a good representation of the district. And then on top of it, I layered basically something very close to a Guinness. So an Irish stout. Um, and um, <clears throat> for like cross Guinness off your bingo card. Yeah, right? <laughs> yeah. but yeah. Always talk. About we've it. talked about Guinness a lot. And one of the things Ryan and I love about it is that it is, it's dark. It has roasty flavor, like dark quote unquote flavors, mm -hmm. but it's smooth and easy to drink. Mm -hmm. And at the beginning of the game, the, the, um, I guess like the, the characters, I believe it, it takes them a hot minute to like realize what is going on. You know, there's, there's sort of this insidiousness of the game that it's like, um, it's dark, but it's subtle at the same time. Um, mm -hmm. and it, and it layers over so perfectly that like the residents of Shibuya who are normal and alive, don't, don't even realize that it's there. Yeah. Um, and so that, that was sort of, that, that was my theming for mine. Um, and that was kind of what I was primarily trying to capture this dichotomy of this struggle for existence, this dire struggle for existence layered on this like cool, vibrant urban setting. How about you, Ryan? Well, mine is not nearly as deep as yours. <laughs> <laughs> Make it up. I, I might have to. Um, so I, I kind of talked about, or I kind of talked about how like you're, you're, you're constantly going through these different things and always fighting what they call noise in this game. And that's how you kind of level up and get better, get stronger, find special abilities. Um, and one of the things that you, you do have to end up doing is um, going to restaurants eating food, having drinks, like shakes and stuff to kind of build up that energy so you can continue doing this fight. So I wanted to do something that not only um, captures the game a little bit and where they are, um, but also give into what they would actually drink in the game. So I did um, Noisy Raced. Um, so it is a Japanese rice lager. It is very, very light, very, very easy to drink and something that you can just... And you can pound four of them and not feel anything. Sushi beer. It is very, <laughs> yeah, very much sushi beer. So like <clears throat> rice beer has been around a long time. It's been made across the world. But obviously you have um, Asahi, Sapporo, Kirin, and Tiger are your main brands that you'll find commercially around the world. Um, they're, depending on which one you have, they're dry to not as dry very, very simple flavors. Um, and most of them probably, I believe you, Sriracha Ace Hops, which is a Japanese hops. Yeah. Um, so so, very, very Japanese yes. style. Um, the Sriracha Ace Hops actually give it kind of a, a lemony flavor to it, but also with a little bit of dill and tea as, uh, with the flavor as well. So I wanted something that's very, very simple to, to drink. Um, and this is probably the simplest thing. It's four and a half percent. Um, it barely has any hop flavor to it. It did take me three tries to make it <laughs> because all the other times I made it, it was coming up to about 2% alcohol, which is <laughs> a little too weak, too weak. So I ended up it's learning. I, I, I did a new technique to, um, to get more of the, the sugars out. So it becomes a little stronger to get to that about four and a half percent, which is where I wanted it to be. So <clears throat> it's perfect for what I wanted it to be. It fit the bottle. Um, it's not crazy in flavor, but it's very, very light and very, very easy to drink. Uh, I have a question for you about yes. that. Um, you were talking about like Japanese hops and things in, in America. Was that hard for you to find? Was it hard to get any of the uh, ingredients? Uh, honestly, no. Uh, Sriracha Ace is a very common hop that you can find here in the United it's, States. It's gotten popular. Yeah, it's definitely so it's a recently. lot of places, um, even local breweries around us are doing rice lagers with Sriracha Ace. Yeah. Um, for the flavor and everything and most of the other ingredients are pretty basic <clears throat> you use rice solids which is obviously you can get anywhere um, and then i just kind of use a couple of different um very light um in flavor uh grains um <clears throat> that kind of give it a, a little bit of color and it's a little bit of sweetness um widely available yeah, yeah and very very easy to find so i didn't i didn't have a, a, a whole lot of issue yeah. i i would be curious to know if there are any listeners who uh who are like longtime home brewers who were like, for instance, home brewing 10 years ago or something. I would love to know whether that was the case 10 years ago, whether you could find like Maybe, yeah. or, or whether that's a recent thing. Cause I think we are like blessed with a, with a ridiculous array of like ingredient choices these days. Yes. And I'm, I'm curious how recent a development that is. Yeah. 
but all right so um <clears throat> i think maybe we'll we'll go over the the, the particulars of the survey after yeah. the break yeah we can definitely do that and then so we'll go a quick break we're gonna take our our first samples of these beers this is my i have not tried any mike's beer Mike has not tried mine yet. And obviously, I'm assuming you guys haven't cracked anything open. I've been on your Ryan's end. house like three times and haven't gotten to try it. I know. And I've actually almost drank all of it by myself. So. <laughs> you <laughs> saved me I, like the last I time. literally, because I, I I do, I don't know if you see behind Mike, I do track uh, my beers on how much everyone drinks on a, a blackboard. So I, I do marks on how much. So I know, generally I know by every gallon you get 10 beers. So I, I by how many gallons I put in there, I know how much I have. And I did about a gallon and a half of this. And there's own and I've had, or someone has had three, four, five, six, seven, eight gone already. Uh-oh. Now granted, two to each of you. So that's part of that. But um, so yeah, I, I had to stop drinking it. Thankfully I had another one I could drink. So um <laughs> keep me busy. You didn't uh, die of thirst. No, I did not. Uh so we'll go to quick break. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll do a quick break. We'll do our surveys and do some sampling. All right. All right. Cheers. Cheers. Welcome to our new podcast. Welcome to our new podcast. This isn't working. Agreed. I think we're going to have to do it turn by turn. Well, now that you mention it, we are a brand new RPG video game podcast. Our very existence hinges on turn-based gaming. So join us on the Turn by Turn podcast, where we'll be talking about Pokemon, Fire Emblem, Golden Sun, Shining Force, Mother, and so many more. It's your turn to come and join us. (laughs) (laughs) Has this ever happened to you? Ah, This video game is bullshit! Are you tired of gaping plot holes and boring gameplay mechanics? Look, all I'm saying is that if a full-fledged Krogan is falling off a platform, there's no way Commander Shepard has the upper arm strength to pull him up! Has reading become just too tedious of a chore? Ugh, books. Are you bored of your same three murder podcasts? Shocking, it's the butler. Allow me to introduce you to the brand new fan fiction podcast, with an X, hosted by our lovely basement dwelling and real life Muppet, Dan McCoy. Well, that's hurtful. And myself, of course, the blonde bombshell with the blood of Odin and the great looks of Jake Busey from Starship Troopers. That's accurate. And with our powers combined. No. Oh, you never let me do what I want to do. I said no, man. We're not doing that. Ah, fine. Anyway, you can find us on Apple Podcasts, wherever you get your fix from. Remember, fan fiction with an X. And we are back. And uh, while on the break, everybody had a chance to pour out mine and Ryan's beer uh, and uh, take some some notes. We we filled out the same tasting survey that we used last time. So for anybody who watched our Zelda episode, you'll know that we we use a tasting survey that uh, is like based off the one that Brewlosophy uses in their mm-hmm. um, short and shoddy episodes. So. The thing that I really like about this survey is that it, I think, is just way more. The the flavor descriptors are like simple. They're simple and yeah. they're they're sensible. You don't need to like have taken a course in in like uh, gastronomics or like beer tasting to understand what they're talking about. And so basically, there's you you pick sort of in order the. Uh, our, our survey is what is the most prominent hop characteristic, the most prominent malt characteristic, then rate the overall hoppiness, maltiness, and dryness slash crispness of the beer on a one to five scale. Note any other flavors that aren't covered by the previous questions. And then we had two special questions for this episode, which is one, based on the survey doer's own ideas about the world ends with you, how well does the beer capture the essence of the game? And then we provided a description of basically what Ryan and I said before the break of our idea of it. And then based on our own description, how well did we achieve Mm -hmm. that idea? Um, And so I, I, 
uh, again, Ryan's beer was called Noise Cleared Japanese style rice lager. I don't think I covered this, but um, my like layered beer was or supposed to be a layered beer. Um, <laughs> it <laughs> it did not work, not to well. work out as, as well in practice as it or in, in uh, reality as it did when I practiced it. But uh, but um, the two beers were called Real Ground and Underground. Um, those being the the kind of real Shibuya district. And then like the underground is sort of the site of the Reapers game, the alternate kind of reality stacked on top of it. Yep. So, um, so with that said, let's dive into the first one. Who's, whose beer do you want to start with? Start with, let's do yours. Okay. So, so we're, we're starting with, uh, yeah. The RGUG. So um, what, what did you guys note? Uh, maybe we'll just, we'll, continue let's go reverse alphabetical order here ah, um so <laughs> what, what, why don't we all just state your answers uh and then we can talk about it what did you rate as being the most prominent hoppy characteristic i had two actually so i had the main one was probably more of an earthy taste uh hop flavor to it and the other one was more like a berry okay daniel, daniel i think you're next you're next <laughs> too many letters um yeah that, that was actually my same assessment i felt the the ug was the the earthy feeling one and then the the cherry one was way more fruity okay mm -hmm. and just out of out of curiosity if you had to pick one for like the the layered beer or whatever the the like combined the effect of both of them together what would you say was like the very most the most potent flavor between both yeah earthy versus berry if you had to pick only one i'd say earthy myself yeah me too okay all right chris well i picked four <laughs> <laughs> okay. so i'm sitting over here sweating um <clears throat> but i was not told that i couldn't do that so i'm just gonna <laughs> it roll with it it does most say characteristics most yeah yeah you're right it does that's okay. Yep. That's misleading. You're that's fair. Okay, you have a legitimate <laughs> grievance here. Yes. <laughs> well, 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 what were the four? This is an interesting talking point, anyway. Yeah. So uh, I marked fruity, pine slash resonance, uh, floral, and berry. Okay, so if you had to pick a top one, live on the air, <laughs> well, what would you pick as he's being a fresh taste? Yeah, he's giving it a fresh taste as being the most prominent. Um. I'll go floral, I think. Okay, mm -hmm. that's a good one. Um, the floral, I think, would describe the the hops that we used in the cherry hibiscus wheat. I would probably classify as being largely floral. We use a lot of sots, which some people, you know, I think, is kind of floral, and I get it. I get a very spicy thing from that. Yeah, and then. Um, earthy that's like uh, we used all good old-fashioned british hops in oh, yeah. the uh, stout yes and they're they're known for being very earthy some people even say like like tea like or like mushroomy yeah. um and so that makes that makes sense to me i was sort of curious how did did you find that this question was sort of hard to answer when taking the two beers together because i was curious how that would go like whether it would sort of muddle Having I thought that the the mixed version of it, it felt like the coffee sort of took over the entire experience in, in for me anyway. Okay, interesting. I can concur a little bit. Like it, it definitely that's that's why I went earthy more than the berry myself. Yeah. Like when I took my first sip, the first thing I marked was earthy, and then after a couple more sips, I, I that's why I wanted to add the berry to it because I think a little bit of a tartness to it. Okay. Good deal. Um, all right. Then let's talk about noise clear. Then let's talk about Ryan's beer. Uh, so um, I will start and I will say that uh, I checked floral as being the most prominent hop characteristic of noise clear. How about you, Daniel? Uh, yeah, floral for me as well. Okay. Very light. <laughs> Fresh sip Just as well. One final yep. sip yeah. <laughs> before he reads his, his um, more responses. Hold on. How many did you check off on this one? Three. Okay. That's it. Okay. <laughs> right, so let, let's, let's hear the three first. Yeah, I do want to hear the three. Uh, I said earthy, pine, slash resinous, and floral. Okay. All right. Yeah. And then what would you rate as top? Uh, also probably floral. 
And okay. just so you know, for the duration of this, I will never be offended if you just tell me I'm wrong. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, see, no, that's that's the thing though. Like everyone has a different flavor with yeah. it. Like going back to the Zelda one, I remember uh, there's a video David took of him doing my beer. My beer that I did was a spiced beer. It had peppers in it. It had serranos and poblano peppers. And he, as a video of him, he sent of him tasting the beer. He goes, "Is that cinnamon? I think that's cinnamon." Yeah. and i was just I, I i just laughed because like it's it is a spiciness to it but it's a different kind of spicy right yeah so yeah. everyone it's, it's right. everyone's gonna yeah. be different it, and sure. i won't judge anyone on it yeah this it's a subjective thing so that that's what's interesting about that there's no right or wrong answer we're not trained professionals here there are trained professionals that do this but we yeah. are not those. But, but even so though like what these are subjective questions so sure. you can't be wrong you yeah. can't be wrong about them but it does seem like floral was overwhelmingly yeah the now is, is is that what you expected is that what you ryan would probably have uh, have said did you drink all your beer i need a first sip <laughs> um, I did. um if i if i had to pick one i'd probably go with floral with the hops that i picked um so the sriracha ace we talked about had kind of a lemon almost and then a slightly dill and tea flavor to it the other hops that i put in there was um warrior hops which also have kind of a citrus uh, flavor to them but kind of more pineapple grapefruit and lemon but i didn't put that much in there of that so yeah, it, it kind of a balance it was probably your bitter and half right? yeah no that was yeah no, no, that was the last one. Oh, really yeah. okay i put that at the end um yeah i i i definitely uh, yeah i guess that's one thing i didn't notice that like i kind of came in with prior information like I, I knew that sriracha could be sort of like lemongrass and dilly I found that to be by far the most prominent hop characteristic. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I'm just tasting what I expected to taste, but I like, I've, I've never in a Sriracha beer before, like had it be so obvious, uh, at least what I, what I think I was tasting. Um, and it was really interesting and very unique, but I kind of picked floral cause I thought it was the closest to mm -hmm. that sensation. I didn't think any of the others really. No, I, and I agree with those flavors. I think the only thing it's, I think, yeah, I don't think anything else would really come close to that with what I was going for. Fruity, maybe, but um, it's a different type of fruit. It's a citrusy yeah. uh, flavor to it. Um, okay, so let's move on. So question two, malt characteristics uh, for uh, RGUG. Um, let's, well, I guess we'll go the other the other direction. Actually, let's, let's just switch it up. We're going to start with Daniel this time. <laughs> <laughs> go in the middle. We'll go uh, Daniel... Ryan, Chris, I don't okay. know. <laughs> I'm really confused. Um, <laughs> I think um, for the UG, I got the earthy again. Mm -hmm. Wait. Oh, wait, sorry, wrong one. The the coffee one. Yeah, coffee. The okay, roast yeah. coffee. I feel like the coffee just kind of took over that. I saw that um, you had listed that there's chocolate in there too. Didn't really get a sense of that. It was definitely but I feel like coffee is just so strong. It takes over whatever it, it's a part of. So it was coffee for me. I agree actually hundred percent. I think that the roast coffee flavor was there. Um, it wasn't like overpowering, but it was definitely the one that, yeah. that came in the most. I mean, for like, like I, I feel that like Guinness has an overwhelmingly oh, yeah. coffee it flavor. Does. Yeah, it does. That, that's kind of what, yeah. so that's not terribly surprising. Sorry. I, I didn't mean to jump ahead, but Chris, what, what was your response? Well, I picked uh, three of... No, I'm just kidding. Um, <clears throat> I picked six. <laughs> no, this says this one said choose the one characteristic, so I did okay. that. Um, I pick, I went with caramel slash sweet. Okay. Oh, there we go. All right. And if you guys are wondering, too, why my answer is like... You're like, man, this guy must have a weird palate. Um, I told these guys beforehand, I don't drink much beer, and my favorite is Dos Equis. And yeah. that's that's the main this thing I have. That. So that's that's my like one pillar of comparison where it's like, oh, this is sweeter than that. Therefore, it is sweet. <laughs> yeah. You, you know what, though? It's it's funny. Like we so we we have this beer on tap at home. Um, and uh, I personally I definitely get the coffee. But now I, I personally perceive, perceive chocolate as being the dominant flavor, but I, I definitely get some level of a sweetness because of that chocolate. You know, it's like kind of creates a sensation of 
sweetness um and and like we didn't bitter it very highly mm -hmm. um at least I, I don't think we can remember <laughs> um but yeah so i i definitely i can see that you know like the these responses uh there's like cracker bread crust toasty nutty caramel sweet chocolate and roast slash coffee for a peek behind the curtain for uh, the listeners like they sort of go in order from light quote unquote to dark, dark quote yeah. unquote flavors and I, I i i think it's fair to say that like all three of the bottom row are kind of present to some extent in this period. No, i can agree so, yeah it is just interesting to see like uh chris don't don't sell yourself short sometimes not being uh we, we we've done like uh episodes where we do these like pseudoscientific tests and uh often like like my my wife does not like hoppy beers and she consistently is the most sensitive taster of hoppy beers yes <laughs> so there's a weird like uh being experienced does not necessarily like make you more uh discerning i guess yeah. I, um, I just think of this meme i saw the other day that was like man who has only watched the movie the boss baby thinks the godfather has a lot in common with boss baby <laughs> <laughs> is he wrong is he wrong right, yeah. i haven't seen boss baby but i know the premise he's not really wrong it's yeah. just kind of that like when you only have one small base of comparison everything is kind of similar to that right. yeah. yeah no yeah. agree 100%. everything everything is like in reference to that <laughs> to reference text boss baby yes <laughs> Okay, so uh, then how, how about Ryan's? Uh, yeah. Noise cleared, uh, malt characteristics. Let's start with Chris this time. Yeah. All right, I feel very confident in saying this one is quite toasty. Mm. Toasty, okay. Nice. I said uh, cracker bread crust, though I definitely got toasty a little bit as well. Daniel? Daniel. So I went with sweet on this one. Caramel sweet. Interesting. Yep. Okay. So we've because, got, uh, we, we got a bit of a spread here. Yeah. Yeah. When I first drank it, I thought it was, there was like an apple tint to it, which upon further sips, there was not. I think it's just, um, <laughs> there, there's like that little bit of lemon that you were talking about in it. And yeah, mm -hmm. like if you have like crappy apples, they usually like come coated in lemon to help like make them last longer. So I think it may have had something to do with that, but oh, inter okay. yeah, interesting association. Yeah, I could see that. Yeah, um, yeah. With my malt, um, with the malt build that I had, it was it's very light uh, malt, so Bohemian uh, malt, which is a lager malt so that's very light in color. Uh, it's supposed to be a little sweeter. Um, it has a acidulated malt, which is oh. it's slightly uh, soured, is what that does. So. There isn't a whole lot of it, but it kind of balances that sweetness a little bit. Um, and then I think the rest was just the rice itself. So okay. like, so I can see how the sweetness comes in there a little bit. Sweet, I think most sweet of, sometimes yeah. just comes through in the balance of yeah. the beer, like more so yeah. than yeah, like a, a, a malt flavor. But I I, I feel like uh uh, this kind of makes sense to me because it wasn't like a bone dry version of no. a, of a rice lager. So. I didn't want a super bone dry one. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Like uh, like Asahi, mm -hmm. uh, Asahi super dry is like a great food beer. But I tried just having one, just like independent of food, <laughs> and it kind of like was not a great experience because it's so dry that mm -hmm. like it made me thirsty. Like I stopped yeah. drinking it halfway through and had a glass of water. I just like, it wasn't quenching my thirst at all. Yeah. But I, I feel like um, I get toasty often in beers that are, um, that are fairly dry. Yeah. Or at least I, I, I should say this, not all dry beers are toasty, but to me, toasty is a, to me kind of a dry flavor. Yeah. So I, I can see how that could be an association as well. Yeah. Um, okay. So let's go back. Let's go back to yours, RGUG, um, and rating it um, for. Let's do all three at once. Let's do all three at once. Um, I'll go first because I th I thought this was pretty interesting. So for hoppy, I actually put a one. Okay. Like I didn't get a whole lot of hoppiness with it. It's not a and it's not a bad thing. It's just I think when I think hoppy, I think you usually think IPA. You think of that bitterness and everything else, and that's wasn't a lot there malt multi-wise i got a four like that was that was pretty uh pretty strong flavor overall 
and the dry crisp of it, I actually gave it a three. It, it had a decent uh, dryness and wanting to drink more of it. Like it might, mine is gone. It's gone. So oh, I didn't bring <laughs> uh, I mean, you can have as much uh, of the stout as you want when yeah. you come over on Saturday. Okay. All right. I dig it. I dig it. Uh, who wants to go next? Uh, I'll go next because right. I felt good that my answers were similar. Wide <laughs> <laughs> uh, Ryan's coattails. Yes. Yeah. So Hoppy, I gave it a two out of five. Mm-hmm. And don't ask me to explain what that means. Um, <laughs> Malty, I gave it a three out of five. Um, and then Dry versus Crisp, I gave it a five out of five. I actually thought it was uh, pretty pretty refreshing. Mm-hmm. pretty pretty good and my dry versus crisp i'm a lot more familiar with wines um and that's because uh i work in healthcare and take care of old people and old people really <laughs> like their wines so i've sampled quite a few of those and uh there's one point i was taking care of a lady that her favorite was like the driest of the dry wine <laughs> and i was like this is the polar opposite of that i i could drink this a lot yeah, yeah. I, i'm not a dry person Rock on. All right, Daniel, what do you got? Uh, so I had Hoppy at a two. Okay. And then Malty at a three. All right. You guys are right on point. Yeah. The dry crisp around a four. But again, probably not the, the most intelligent beer drinker you could be. <laughs> <laughs> hey man, you guys yeah. don't you don't need to qualify it. It's okay. It's okay. Um, okay, so so we got we, we got basically uh Taken sort of, we'll take median so I don't have to oh, yeah. do uh, fractions or whatever. But <laughs> we, we got a hoppiness rating of like a two out of five, you know, kind of a two minus, a multi being a kind of three plus, and then a dry rating of four. Yeah. Oh, that's pretty good. No, that's really good. Neither of these were particularly meant to be hoppy. The, yeah. the contrary to what I said earlier, I think we actually did put a decent number of IBUs in the stout because it's just true to the style. Yeah. But no flavoring hops yeah. at all. Um and then uh for the wheat beer similarly I didn't want the hoppiness to crit to clash with like the, the tartness. Yeah. Um because that can be sort of weird and like clash with the fruit flavors. So we played that pretty safe too. So I, I can see that. Since you guys said that the uh, the flavors of the um, stout were kind of the dominant flavors mm-hmm. of the the sort of mixed version of the drink, makes sense that it would be decently malty, but that maybe the the wheat beer attenuated that a little bit. Yeah, and I'm pleased to hear it's dry because these were both meant to be fairly dry, yeah. um, fairly dry beer, so they should mix into a dry uh, combination. Yeah. I guess. Okay. All right. Um let's do chris let's have you go first for uh for for your beer yeah noise cleared all right um for hoppy i gave it a four for malty i gave it a three and then for dry versus crisp i thought it was uh, a bit more dry so i gave it a three okay all right i'll go next okay um, I had hoppiness at a three. I had malty down at a one, and I okay. had dry crisp at a four. Thought it was fairly dry, but not as you said, not not bone dry. Yeah, but but drinkable, nice and drinkable. Um, was I going the wrong way? Is crisp a zero? Well, so dry, uh, you know, <laughs> like zero would be like sweet and or like lingering ah okay i had it the opposite way around <laughs> so the last one i was saying was very crisp this one i'm saying is a little more dry okay so okay. for the for the future for the survey i would flip those to where it, it says crisp point slash point? dry maybe we'll just pick one uh maybe we'll just stick with crisp only or something <laughs> all right daniel what do you got so for hoppy i had a th- uh, three slash four. Um, we'll call it three though. Uh, okay. for Malty, I also headed around a three. Okay. And for the, the dry crisp, I had that at a four. All right. So, not too bad. I, I'm actually surprised with the hops because I didn't think I put that much of the hops in there. So, 
to be in that middle upper level with three and fours yeah. higher than you so how did i expect it especially yeah. with the ibus i would say for me like it's not happy in the sense that like an ipa is happy mm -hmm. um but there just were prominent flavors the most prominent flavors i thought were like hot flavors okay. like i said to me it was that kind of like lemongrass and dill sort of mm -hmm. thing um so that was my hoppiness rating. Like it yeah. wasn't hoppy in the traditional sense. Yeah, gotcha. And of course, I think malty was probably right on point. I would, I didn't have a lot of super strong malts in there. Uh, the dry crisp probably about right where I wanted it as well. So I think that's I I think it's right on point for what I was hoping for. So are, are you flipping my answers on the dry crisp one? Yeah. Okay. Good. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So moving on to other flavors. Um, so for uh, RGUG, um, since I list additives, it's a bit of a loaded question, <laughs> I guess. But uh, in addition to the uh, what was covered in the first three questions, did you guys like sense any other flavors present in the beer? I didn't. Um, nothing that really stuck out to me. A lot of flavors is what I what I really felt having that slight um tardiness and with the berry and then that earthy and that kind of roasty coffee flavor they all they all worked very well together yeah um, and I, I remember you said on the break like you got the sense of tartness from the hibiscus but you didn't get whatever you consider like hibiscus flavor to yeah. be interesting how about so you, you did now you you talked about like berry hop flavor do you think that came from the cherry i think so probably okay. Yeah, because I'm not sure what hops I used could have like contributed berry flavors. I'm assuming that probably came from the from the fruit. Yeah. But I can see how it didn't come through as like cherry specifically. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, did, did you guys have any other flavors to note, Daniel, Chris? Yes. <clears throat> uh, the aftertaste, I felt like that cherry kind of comes through a little bit more. Okay. Okay. And I, I was like, I don't know if this is something that because we talked about it, I'm like imagining it's there, but <laughs> I think it's there. No, no, no. It's it's definitely, we do, we do that all the time with different, like we do our field research episodes and we taste the beer and then we dive into what's actually in it and be like, oh yeah, I can taste that now. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's there. It's definitely there. Yeah, I um, I was actually pretty nervous. So like, we didn't want to over tart it. I, I like the flavor of tart cherries way more than black cherries, mm -hmm. personally. But we were worried with the hibiscus making that beer tart already, that if we use tart cherries, it would like go overboard. Yeah. And we didn't want it to be, we didn't want it to taste like a sour. So I used black cherry juice and I was worried because uh, when I tried it like flat, you know, like before we carved the beer up, yeah. um, I got this really medicine taste because it's like Ooh. part of the reason medicine, like cherry medicine tastes so weird is like, imagine the flavor of a black cherry, which you know, in your head is sweet, but take all the sweetness away and make it bitter, like mm -hmm. medicine bitter instead. It creates this weird sensation and that was kind of what I was getting when it was flat. Yeah. And it was only after it had like carved up that it tasted like actual cherries again. <laughs> so I was there like really nervous. I, I thought we were going to have to dump it, mm -hmm. uh, like to be completely honest. Um, so I'm, guys, I'm glad that that came across to at least one of you. <laughs> yeah. Are you guys familiar with Moxie? It's it's like a soda. Uh, no. I was about to say, I know. I'm familiar the, with the, the concept. The concept of having Moxie. <laughs> but yeah. I have Moxie sometimes. Uh, but, no, I'm not familiar with the soda. So in Maine, I'm from Maine. Um, there's a soda called Moxie, and it's sort of like um, it tastes a lot like your dry, dry Irish stout. And um, so, interesting. Hmm. The first taste is kind of like the. It's not alcoholic. I don't think you might have to be an alcoholic to drink it, but. Um, <laughs> so it, it starts with that flavor when it hits the tongue, and then like once you kind of like gulp or like take a bite of something with it, the aftertaste of it is Coke. It's really, really strange, but it, it reminds me a lot of your beer. <laughs> Interesting. Interesting yeah. hmm. I was going to say, it kind of reminds me of like uh, a much less nuanced answer is uh, after you have like a good shake at Sonic and then you have the cherry last and it's kind of that, like the little no, cherry on top. That. That makes a ton of sense. I, I actually think what both you guys are saying makes sense because it is 
having a layered beer is a weird sensation because you have like two things that have their own flavor profiles that you sort of get in varying amounts. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I find like, well, well, again, Ryan and I did a whole episode where we did variations of layered beers and you do sort of pick up different, you have that experience, exactly what you described of like, you can imagine having had the shake Mm -hmm. and then at the end you get the cherry and it's like, sort of uh it's it's not unrelated because it tastes like the shake it was soaked in but it's different Mm -hmm. and it's sort of like that like working through a um yeah working through a layered beer can be a little weird because you get like different flavors as you go through time yeah yeah and when you leave that's that's kind of what it leaves you with yeah Yeah. and that that sort of matches daniel's description too of like your first sip is one thing and by the time you get to the end you're left with a different impression so Mm -hmm. it makes a lot of sense to me so if uh flavors did you guys find in mine what extra flavors? So I, I already sort of covered mine. I, I, I felt that that kind of uh, spice per, or like not spice, uh, like herbal, like sort of dill and lemongrass quality, I found to be mm-hmm. pretty prominent. Uh, and I would say that was the main flavor on top of sort of what I would expect out of a pretty traditional Japanese rice lager. All right. Chris? I don't, oh, okay. Okay. Daniel, go ahead. I had already sort of mentioned that I I was getting like this weird like apple sensation, but I think it's again like that like preserved apple sensation rather than like actual apple flavor. Okay. Hmm. That's like that's it's interesting. That's like weirdly specific in the best way yeah. because sometimes like if if you listen to brewing podcasts, it's really common to have people say stuff like that. It's like it tastes like uh stewed pumpkins or yes. <laughs> <it's> like, uh, <laughs> some like, random thing yeah. sometimes you need like yeah the, the, that's like a really specific thing and i know exactly what you're talking about so <laughs> maybe you have a history as a or a, a future as a uh a beer <laughs> taster, a, a yeah. Beer taster yeah <laughs> um the other flavors i had were uh I, I said sour, but that's not quite the right word for it, but it's related to sour. Um, the thing that it reminds me of the most is uh, I have a friend that used to homebrew kombucha. Hey, we actually, and we actually said I'm that. just trying that out for the first we yeah, Ryan and I just uh, had a, a bottle of it tonight, actually, my first batch ever. <laughs> yeah, it reminds me of uh, kombucha a little bit. Like it's, I don't know what I would put on it. It's not quite sour. It's not quite spice, but it's like this weird other thing that only that has. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. I get that. I get that. All right. Cool. Okay. So let's, let's do these two together. I was going to say, yeah. we'll do the last two questions together. So based on your own ideas and then based on the brewer's description of the beer, how closely does it adhere to um the aesthetic of the world ends with you so we'll start with mine we'll start with rgug um uh ryan do you want to go first i gave you all fives man oh man yeah i think i mean the style of having the two on top of each other even though we couldn't quite get it to happen here um but the style of having both worlds one on top of the other is a really cool concept um especially having one being the dark one on top and everything was really, really cool. And then going with what you described here, it, you had all the flavors that you really want and the colors as well. That, that, I mean, the vibrant red of the high biscuits is really, really awesome. So five, yeah. five and five. Okay. Thanks. Mm-hmm. Okay. Chris. Uh, I also gave you five and five. Oh man. There you go. I really liked the uh, the idea of the the layered on top of each other, um, and it might help with some of the wow factor that I didn't know layered beers were a thing until about an hour ago when we started the show. <laughs> awesome! <laughs> uh, I was so, I was laughing when I saw the nice. text come in asking, "I had a spoon in my box. Yeah. Is that supposed <laughs> to be there?" Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I had the same question. I was like, "Oh, I guess maybe that fell in." Um, but yeah, so that helped with the wow factor a lot. And I'm like, ooh, that, that was very clever to, to do that, I think. Mm-hmm. Cool. Uh, su- surprise, surprise. I gave it five and five as well. Okay. <laughs> you guys are spoiling me. It is worth mentioning after all of these glowing reviews that uh, in preliminary trials, I was able to get a photo, which we'll probably use in the, the cover art for this episode of like <laughs> a gorgeous 
uh separation however zero of the the three of uh, <laughs> Lion Daniel and Chris were able to actually <laughs> achieve it here so it's I feel like I should dock myself a point for it not actually working out in practice like when it came down to the final exam um but uh yeah thank you yeah I was if you if you want me to dock you another point I can unfortunately <laughs> It's okay. I'll, I'll, the, uh, the, the, the calculations being being done in my own head. It's just I like, I can ding you yeah, one for uh, when I'm comparing the labels. That noise erased label is quite clean, and the RGUG doesn't quite capture the aesthetic as much. Well, I give credit to Mike because he actually designed both labels, so that's all. Oh. He does all nice. the he yeah. does all the all all the all the work yeah. that happens with the. Uh, with my with my, both of ours actually he does all that by himself so yeah yeah kudos he so he gets credit for that so he gets the point back it's a for compliment it. anyway <laughs> yep, yeah you no, do. I, I i can see that i i actually struggled with what to do and and again the label should be you know you can go on our website uh mm-hmm. at or well ruthersinlaw.com um and or if your podcast service shows you like the sort of like I know on YouTube it will. Yeah, yeah. yeah. If, if you watch on YouTube, you'll be able to see that the photo. But um, yeah, so I actually used, if, if you look at the logo, I filled in the kind of interstitial stuff, but the middle little separator is the world ends with you. It's like the text from the title. Um, mm-hmm. I just filled it in because I, you know, I didn't really need that there. I just wanted it to look like the separation thing. It looks like that. Like I, I think you did a good job on that. Maybe and what the, I would have added. The buildings was... behind it are like from the title, but the trick was, or like also from the like the cover art of the game. But yeah, the trick was just like getting all the text on there in a way that wasn't cluttered looking was definitely a bit of a challenge. And I don't think I like ever got it completely perfect. I would I would agree with you there. Uh, a small thing I think that might have made it look a little bit. Uh, cleaner would be the UG and the RG on the label are in the same spot. I might have uh, the one that goes on the bottom. I might have put that under that separation. Yeah, you know, I actually thought about uh, keeping the colors consistent and just like being cheeky and having all the text upside down on mm-hmm. uh, the one that was on the bottom. But because uh, like Stone Brewing does that in some mm-hmm. of theirs, they have like the label just totally upside down with all. You have to flip the bottle up to read it. But uh, I just. Once I had it printed, I was just like, I don't know. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to say I'm glad that you didn't do that because I'm yeah. sitting here reading ingredients and stuff. And yeah, since I've already got it open, I don't want to like. Yeah, it just it, it just seemed like uh, like um, edgy, but inconvenient ultimately. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, OK, so uh, let's let's move on to do uh, to do Ryan's. Uh, let's just go in reverse order, I guess. So we'll go uh, Dan or Chris me. Daniel. OK, so for my own ideas about the game, I went with a four. OK. And then for Ryan's ideas about the game, I went with a five. True. I, for the exact same reasons, also went with a four and a five. And yeah. also because I was like, I'm not going to be like, they're both great. I'm like, no, y- y'all are trying to pick a winner. I got <laughs> no, 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 I get it. I get it. <laughs> we tried to be objective. We just like Mike a little more. <laughs> <laughs> I get it. I get it. <laughs> I will, uh, I, I'll be the Scrooge of the group. I gave you a three and a five. Oh, so so I, And again, hey, these, these are my ideas. Uh, the, 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 this was sort of my thought process. Like my, my now in full admission, my mind definitely settled for a little bit on rice lager too just with it being a japanese style when i was developing my idea i when playing the game my experience didn't involve i i didn't end up using the like restaurants very much so that just was not a part of like my experience of the game with that said i i uh i almost gave you a four for your idea of the the beer uh, and I feel kind of like an idiot about this. I, I almost <laughs> gave you a four based on like my tasting it and just comparing it to like other rice loggers. And then I actually read your description after I'd already circled in and went, oh, shoot. <laughs> actually, that's spot on. And I upgraded it to a five because I think like some of the light citrus flavor in particular, which is kind of, you know, I'm like, I 
the the Dylan lemongrass thing has a citrus component to it. Mm-hmm. And that was the one thing that like was stronger than in a lot of rice lagers, but you list it in your own vision of the beer. So yes. can't dock for that. Yeah. So yeah. Well, cool. I think Mark, nice job. I think Mike wins then. <laughs> it's not a competition, guys. They said it was. <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah. Um, I, I didn't know how y'all were doing it, but if it makes you feel better, I would definitely keep both of these in my fridge if it was an option. Nice. <laughs> good to hear. Yeah. Especially from someone that, that that's a, a yeah. big beer drinker. Yeah, that's right, always yeah. good to hear. If, if just in case you don't like the wine that uh, your uh, yeah. <laughs> clients have on, <laughs> on hand, almost never. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try anything once, though. Yeah, that's yeah. Th- um, Something that occurred to me, and uh, this might just be kind of random. I almost think you could swap out the cherry hibiscus wheat ale with Ryan's and get a very similar effect. I don't know. Maybe that's just me. I might have to try that. I, I wonder if they would layer. But I don't know about layering, just like as far as like sure. having like. Yeah, the blend like, of flavor. I mean, they didn't layer <laughs> yeah, yeah. in practice here, so I guess it's fine. But yeah, yeah. Uh, Ryan, yeah. I think, is going to try it here. You've, you guys you've keep his interest. I was about um, to say he's moving. <laughs> I can actually, I, I can really see that working because there are a lot of, there are variations of like the like the layered beer that are done with like kind of clean, crisp lager style beers. Uh, like Stella Stella Artois is like a common one. They they call it the Black Star. Ooh, it's it's working. Oh, this might be the photo, Ryan. Actually, this is definitely the photo. This might be the photo, and then we'll just do it with the the labels. <laughs> Well, take the photo before you drink the beer. <laughs> uh, you lift the spoon as you pour. Yes. That makes sense. That it's might be why mine didn't work. It did it. <laughs> hey, that's beautiful. Dude, that's gorgeous. Yeah. I want to take a drink of it. Take take a picture of that and we'll we'll make it work. We'll do some sort of <laughs> tripartite thing where like your beer on one side, my beer on the other, and then the combination <laughs> of the two, it's like a Dragon Ball Z fusion. There you go. I was <laughs> thinking that beer. same thing. <laughs> um Okay, hey, so, that could be a, a theme for next season. Oh, yeah, yes. I uh, so now I, I know that uh, now, now that we're sort of through the survey, I just wanted to talk real quick. I know we don't got a ton Actually, of time left. Um, go for it. Actually, it's really, really interesting combo. I'll buy it. Yeah, that works. Yeah, yeah. it is. It's, it's quite interesting. Yeah. Um, I, I, I don't know. The like this actually comes out a lot more. It does, but it, it clashes a little weirdly with like, it, I feel like I put a sprig of dill in my coffee and I don't know how I, <laughs> in my mocha, I don't know how I feel about that. Yeah. But um, I just real quickly wanted to cover, I found this like a unique challenge because when we did the Zelda one, both Ryan and I gravitated to the like cooking mechanic in Breath of the Wild yeah. and used that. So it was like, there were, there were food items in the game that we used as essentially additive ingredients. Mm-hmm. It was kind of a shortcut to make, um, to sort of turn video game into foodstuffs. Um, and I found that way harder to do with this game. Like there were restaurants that sold food, but it was kind of just mm-hmm. generically Japanese food, like miso and like, or generically American food, like cheeseburgers. And they had, they had <laughs> you could buy though. fries and stuff and curry. Yeah. But like, nothing really stuck out as particular to this game. So it was a lot more challenging um, to, to like just sort of come up with ways to translate. Um, So like, have you guys seen anywhere else, whether it's like a Harry Potter cookbook or whatever, have you seen any other really good examples of like media being turned into food in a way that you feel like really captures the the spirit of that media because like i found this to be a unique challenge did while you guys think ryan did you have a, a similar problem I, I i did it was i mean i gravitated directly to a rice lager i think even in that meeting back in august i think i was even talking about doing a rice lager for almost from the beginning from from first thought <laughs> so like i kind of got set in my ways and i just didn't want to change and that's why i stuck with it and I ended, I wanted to do other flavors like maybe a cherry blossom, but I ended up just keeping oh, yeah. it simple. I actually looked into that, and it seemed very complicated to get cherry blossom yeah. because, like, aside from fresh cherry blossom, it's normally p- pickled to yeah. preserve it. Yep, and that seemed weird. <laughs> um, I didn't like that. But to answer your question, actually, I, one of my favorites is probably Lord of the Rings or The Hobbit, where like I've, yeah. I've had I do have a Hobbit cookbook 
and like going through the different meals of different things and different cultures of yeah. of the world of of lord of the rings yeah. it's really cool seeing all those different things and yeah. wanting to try it yeah tolkien must have been a foodie because they you definitely oh, yeah. do get the sense of like you can easily pick out the sorts of foods that a particular race would eat mm -hmm. what about you guys i know that for me um like thinking about like chopped, like I've made a lot of like gummy bear crusted chicken breasts lately. So interesting. Breasts. All right. <laughs> oh, I, I, I was totally making that up. I'm sorry. Uh, I mean, I've seen I chopped. I was really questioning how I've seen but... chopped, and I would I could see them putting gummy bears and yeah. chicken breasts together, and them doing something like that. So I, I've actually made like flame and hot Cheetos crusted chicken breasts once, yeah. and it was like decent. Not bad. They didn't crisp up quite right, but it's yeah. pretty good. No, I, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Bad joke. Uh, the only one, the, the first one that came to mind to me is um, I really like the stories of H.P. Lovecraft. I don't know if you guys are familiar. Yes. Yep. Yes. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and uh, in the, the bookstore the other day, I saw the uh, Necro Nama Nom Nom. <laughs> And uh, it's it looks like, you know, this eldritch book that has all these weird diagrams and stuff like somebody dealing with uh, an eldritch horror, but it's really like a drink recipe. And it's weird that you said gummy bears because I pulled up the first recipe that comes up and uh, it's called At the Fountains of Madness. And it's you uh, I already love put it. a gummy bear in like gelatin and then it says at the end serve and drink down your helpless victims <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness so that should be a stupid answer like mine but it's real so yeah it's yeah. it's presented <laughs> like a, it should be yeah um yeah it says like freeze freeze the uh, i'll read a couple of the steps real fast it says freeze the creatures and keep them frozen the bears cannot be trusted it's true uh, <laughs> mix the carbon bearing base substrate with the dark syrup so it's like very themed and then it says damn the professor the professor's theory about the milk proteins add for disturbing results <laughs> so it seems cool. very very on brand for it a, really does yeah. yeah um uh yeah <laughs> i love that so oh much. that is awesome um so yeah and then i guess one one other sort of follow-up question to that um what sorts of things this is this is kind of maybe like getting to be something of a meta question but like like we talked about earlier video games on a lot of levels seem to for whatever reason be difficult to adapt i think the obvious answer is just that like taking away the interactivity often it's you know i well i mm -hmm. think the easy answer is that like most of the adapters like hollywood and stuff just don't, don't do you know, the job yeah, right? they don't really understand the source material very well but yeah. I think another easy thing is just that like the interactivity is such a part of the experience that it can be difficult to like to separate what else makes the video game like it gives it its identity apart from that interactivity um, or you need to find a substitute for it, you know, almost. Um, so what sorts of things, you know, if, if I, I would contend that food is kind of tricky unless it's a video game about food or that, you know, sort of like has a food mechanic. So what sorts of things do you think video games are more easily adapted to, if anything? Um, I wanted to expand on that real quick too, a little bit why I think it's difficult, if that's okay. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think I had an interesting idea on that. Um, Cause I think there's two components that really play in. And the first is difficulty. In that if you watch some of these like Mario speedrunners play a Mario game, the idea you would get like in adapting it to food is like, oh, extremely smooth, colorful, um, easy, that kind of thing. But right. then you watch somebody like my dad play a Mario game and you're like, hmm, <laughs> bitter, <laughs> frustrating, uh, Maybe slow. We'll take mushroom risotto. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and the other is, I think that. Uh, Hollywood especially has a message in mind that they want to push a lot of the times. And then it's like, well, how can we put can we the social message this? we've decided yeah. on top of this video game thing? And it's like the end result is already kind of decided. Yeah. But when you're adapting a work that was taken seriously by another author, um, and that's really what I view video game creators as like, you know, you're an author telling a story. Um, 
it doesn't really work to try and put your own message where theirs already is. You, you know, they, they've already right. done that work for you. Yeah, yeah. like you, 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 you might, you know, th- there are great examples of movie adaptations, something like Blade Runner, where like they are kind of fundamentally altering the message, but not in a way that is contrary to the source material. Mm-hmm. It's just like a different exploration. And yeah, I think you're right. Like when you when you start with your idea and then you try and superimpose source material onto it, there's a pretty high chance there's going to be some rub there. Whereas if you start with the source material and go where it takes your brain, mm-hmm then you're, you know, that's a very different thought process. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Ridley and I think Scott's. Those, you're starting to see a little bit of that change too, because like, it's a smaller thing, but it was a huge thing when the first Sonic the Hedgehog movie came out and that first trailer <laughs> came out with those weird little eyes, like the world rioted and like, granted for them, it's, it's slightly easier thing because it's CGI, but like to go through and fix that to make sure the fans were happy you're starting to see a little more you're starting to see video games video game movies be better we went back talking about mario back in the 90s like they took so much out of that and made it into their own of cyberpunk or cyberpunk back in the 90s and trying to show the future but like now you're seeing like movies like uncharted where like they're trying to stick with a lot of the source material and not do a whole lot of crazy changes to it but still do a different story and i think that's another key thing is doing a different story if they ever did a mass effect movie i don't know if i would really want to see it even though it's my favorite game because i am shepherd i make shepherd the way i want to be you do it a different way my wife does it a different way i i've done fenship i've done mel shep they're both great who you romance with is all great but everyone has a different way of doing it and there's no way you could do that movie it's at not all. necessarily no. fun to watch someone else's version mm-hmm. of it once you get taken out of the equation yeah. now if you do a separate story within that realm then that could work but if you're going to do a, a carbon copy of what the game was it generally doesn't work now no i was gonna say too with sonic to me that design was just a lot of arrogance because sonic i think based on only his design had just survived 15 plus years of bad games in a row <laughs> like, <laughs> yes the only thing that kept sonic afloat was that his design was fantastic <laughs> no. yeah um, um but to get back to your root question what are things that you could kind of translate games into um i think it's again you have to like he was saying about mass effect you have to kind of sidestep the question of adaptation in that if you're trying to just to do it again you're never going to do it better than it was already done in the eyes of the people that already like that thing. You know, it's kind of like how even uh, Americans try to adapt different animes and they're like, well, we can just make it like less Japanese. And everybody's like, this is weird. Yeah. Um, (laughs) Yeah. I know. I think Bob had that issue. Yeah. Yes. And that's just the, the latest in a long line that have that problem. Yeah. Um, but it's sort of like with the world ends with you, you couldn't set it in New York city and be like, it's the same thing. It, it, people same. would be like, what? Um, so I think you just have to kind of sidestep that question and do that, different that feels stories. Very much like, like a bad sequel. Yeah. You know? this. <laughs> like, uh, like survivor season 20, you know, it's yes. just like the same thing, but somewhere else. Yes. Um, but yeah, like, so I, I like novelizations a lot. I like tie in novels. Um, okay things that you can ignore if they're like bad elsewhere in the lore yeah yeah just That's something not- that f- fleshes it out take uh take the one character that you see in the background that one time okay here's his story yeah i've I, i've i've gotten into reading a lot of different books so like i've done a couple gears of wars books i've gone to even mass effect i've done a couple books um, Same. The big one i've done is actually star wars because i yep. want more more beefed out stories and everything content content, yeah (laughs) but like i don't really need a movie but like i did one of my favorites is master and apprentice and it's it's obi-wan and and qui-gon like prior to episode one Mm -hmm. and showing that build up of their characters and everything else it was perfect it didn't reference really anything else from anything like yoda was never referenced like nothing sidious was never referenced it was perfect it was a perfect story within that realm that's all i need i don't need anything too crazy um within 
any world like I'm, that. I'm going to go a totally different direction. And uh, also while doing it, I'm going to re-justify my response of my Angry Birds plushie. I, <laughs> I, I think that it it is interesting to me that at least half of our responses, mine and Chris's, uh, using his Fire Emblem card game, uh, were interactive in a different way from being like a video game. Like, uh, I, I think that that is an interesting thing. Like, I think video games set themselves up to be toys or like figures or stuff like that, stuff that you're going to handle and or a different form of a game, like a card game. Uh, I think they do that transformation well because the interactivity is preserved. And so you don't have to compensate for that in any way. Um, and there's just a, there's an inherently limited scope. You know, you're not trying to necessarily, I guess with a card game, depending on the card game, maybe you would try and flesh out some lore or something, but like with a figuring, for instance, you're not trying to expand anything. You're just trying to give someone a different way to interact with a character that they already like interacting with. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I think that that, that's kind of a, it, it's a, it's a non-media response, but uh, so is beer. So <laughs> I think it works. I, I think what we're hitting at is there's sort of an established pattern and maybe that's why it hasn't worked for video games in that um, you have book, book can become movie. Um, you have movie, movie can become action figure line. If your movie does bad, it can become jigsaw puzzle line. Yeah. Um, and that's about it. But video games are much more like some things really work for different games. And some things, if you, a video game is not a one size fits all thing. If you tried to make, you know, uh, Mass Effect small plushes with the idea that you throw them at things, that's a pretty <laughs> they would be like, what? um no you're you that's a really good point that like for mass effect like i don't know that i really need a figure yeah that's just kind of not the point it's it's more cinematic mass effect is almost more like uh not a book exactly no. but like I, there's no way else the, to do the it, things though. that i liked the most about it were the decisions and just like mm -hmm. literally sitting in exhausting dialogue trees with characters just yes. to like get the little bits of world building yes um and that's very different from say a game like the uh, i don't know hollow knight or uh super metroid hey just picking at random my <laughs> favorite games of all time but like where they're about exploration and it's all like soft world building and but it's also very about performing technical feats and like embodying your character physically mm -hmm. in, in a game that's difficult and so like mario you know like maybe there's something about games with a sense of physicality like i would love a mario plushie I don't really need a, a shepherd plushie. <laughs> no, yeah. I would love a hollow knight plushie, but yeah, I don't need a, well, whatever. Well, I'm going to, I think I'm going to might cut everybody off because my battery is about to die on my uh -oh. laptop. So, um, so let's get to where they can find everybody. Mike, where can they find you? Um, so uh, you can find our podcast and thereby find me uh, on Twitter at Bruthers in law. Uh, that's all one word. Um, or uh, on our website, brothersinlaw.com. Again, all one word. Um, and then uh, in addition to that, Ryan, where can people find you? Um, I am mostly um, in the Twitterverse at Rambo Kuhn, R-A-M-B-O-K-U-H-N. Um, I have made my way into the world of TikTok, and I am at Wise Old Owls Brew there. Um, just random videos of me brewing and beer-related things. Me chucking beers, which Oops. is difficult now. It's tough. <laughs> we're, we're getting old. Yeah. Um, where can we find you guys? Because I know there's probably some people interested in listening more about these games. Chris, do you want to Oh, okay. Sure. Uh, you can find <laughs> me uh, at Chris underscore Harkey, I think, on Twitter. Uh, I should double check that real fast. <laughs> I feel bad. I don't uh, use it too much. Hey, that's um, all right. Let me just, yeah, control. Chris at Chris underscore Harkey, H A R K E Y. And you can find me talking about video games, uh, writing, um, all sorts of all sorts of things. Sometimes music. Th those are sort of my my hobbies. All right. Um, and Daniel, where where can we find you? 
You can find me on Twitter at Magar Mentions to see what I'm mentioning, I guess. Um, or you can find our podcast at Turn by Turn Pod. And I, I kind of exist there as well. <laughs> and you can find that podcast as well everywhere you can find uh, Breathers in Law because we're, we got the same production oh, company. Same so it's literally same all the same overlord. places. We got the same sugar daddy. <laughs> <laughs> Before we go to, I had to ask because it's bothering me. Are you brothers in law? I, I'm not. We are brothers yeah. in law, actually. Okay. We're, yep. we're I get like the name. Brothers in law <laughs> squared. We both married into the same yeah. family. Yeah. Whatever you know. Hey, we don't. We don't. Uh, we're 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 basically brothers. We're, uh, we're brothers. But yeah. just brothers is not a very sensible name for this podcast. No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. I, I think it's a great name. Yeah. Thank you. Thank well, you guys so much for uh, for having us too. Yeah, we appreciate you. And for you doing this off. whole thing. Uh, yeah. I can safely say, I don't know if any other collaboration we could possibly come up with would be as high effort as creating a drink from scratch. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's pretty difficult to it's, put it all together. So three yeah, tries, but, three tries. Yeah. <laughs> it's fun to have a reason to do it. And we really appreciate you guys uh, sort of working with us to come up with a cool concept and help us push ourselves and then for for coming on the pod and pushing yourself out of your you know comfort zone a little bit yeah um yeah this was great this is a ton of fun and hopefully we'll uh we'll, we'll see you guys again in the future absolutely yeah All if right. you guys ever want to come uh hot hawk some fire emblem hot takes on us or something on our show feel free fire emblem <laughs> yep. oh my yeah. <laughs> ryan's 160 hours behind me in three houses yes. so he's got some <laughs> Oh, that's all. Uh, in three houses, I'm about 300 hours behind Daniel, so I got to step it up. Oh, boy. Yeah. <laughs> well, hey, well, I, I guess we've all got our homework. And, uh, and until next time, cheers. Cheers, guys. Cheers.